we're going to uh, go back to what we were finishing with last week. Um, and this is thanks to Malka who uh, pursued pursued the issue and and brought my attention to a, a, a Talmudic source. And just in case people weren't following last week with the when I held up the text to the camera here, uh, I brought uh, some images here. So uh, as long as we're on it, and this will be a day of tangents, uh, not necessarily linked to the Joshua test, certainly not directly, but it just feels like when there's an opportunity to share with everybody things that I picked up over the years, as Malka has as well, and all of us who have devoted to years to studying the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, uh, that it's worthwhile to share. And if you heard it before, um, I apologize. And if you haven't heard it yet and you want to hear more, let this be a, a push in that direction. So the, the two images that you have on screen, uh, I'll bring them up just a second. Let's do it there. Also, I've, I had to modify the text sheet for today because there were... Uh, there were some mistakes, not necessarily my own, in fact, not of my own, but uh, I'll talk about that later. Uh, so you can see on the screen right now, under on the left-hand side is Exodus 15, Shirat Hayam, the Song of the Sea. And you'll notice that, that that's just an image I found. Every Torah scroll looks like this. It, it's not easy to find a scribal rendition of Joshua because it's not in the five books of Moses that are in a Torah scroll. And even though you do have in some synagogues, especially according to the custom of the Gra of the Gaon Rabbi Eliyahu, the Elijah, the Ga, uh, Elijah of Vilna, um, in the custom of uh, synagogues that are in his custom, they have actually a, a scroll that looks like a Torah scroll uh, that has, uh, well, no, I'm sorry. It's not, no, no, There, I've seen that before, but it's there is each of the books that has a haftarah in it is uh, they have a scroll for. So, for instance, Isaiah, they've got an entire Isaiah scroll, which is long. Um, if they have Ovadia, it's just the one. I think that I think the trias are together. The 12 are together. Yeah, I, I saw this in a synagogue. I used to pray it for a time. Oh, when I was in transition, I was already no longer orthodox, but I was still orthoprax. And near our house in Jerusalem, there was a, I was walking by to kind of a B'nai Akiva, a modern Orthodox minyan where there was good singing. And a guy said, could you help us make a minyan in traditional Hasidic garb? Turns out he wasn't Hasidic, but he was an old Yerushalmi. He was a Magid, which is a role that doesn't really, uh, uh, you don't hear much about anymore. You, you hear in the renewal circles, but the old Magidim, were not exactly, they were Hasidic, they weren't rabbis, but he turns out he was a Magid, but his the synagogue he was at was not a Hasidic synagogue, it was a synagogue that had always seen a sign that said, um, Alpi Masora Tagra, this synagogue is according to the customs of the Elijah, of the the Gon, the Vilna Gon, of Eli, Elijah the Vilna Gon. And so when they took, if you were called to the Haftarah, you had to read it from the scroll without any tamim, without any trope inside, just like you'd be reading a Torah scroll. And they had under the ark, they had uh, under the ark where the Torah scroll was, they had all the other scrolls. And Okay, so there you would find a Joshua scroll. But but everybody, I, I brought the one on the left. It's just an image from the internet. It doesn't say where it's from because the place where I got the Joshua scroll from, it wouldn't let, it would only let me copy one. I guess maybe there's some sort of mechanism. They don't want you to copy the whole manuscript. In any case... So looking to the left, we can see it's kind of checkerboard. And I pointed that out every time on Simchat Torah when we, we roll the Torah scroll from Devarim to, to, to Breshit. Um, I kind of stopped to see this checkerboard to show it out. And, and so we'll, the Talmud will talk about this in a second. And this is a page from the Leningrad Codex. The Leningrad Codex, there's a number, I forgot what the number is, um, is the oldest... Uh, uh, it's it's from the 11th century. It's the oldest entire manuscript that we have of the Hebrew Bible, of the Tanakh, according to the Masorah. Uh, and all those notes on the side, the letters on the side, um, they're all these abbreviated notations as to how many times it, it, it appears 
in this particular way. They're the things that never really in, in, interested me, although the, that is a subset of, of biblical scholarship, the, the studying the, the Masorah. That is, the Masorah means tradition, but it's the Masorah of the Masoretic text. Um, and that's what gives us today the the vowels and the trope that we have, more or less. Not just this manuscript, there's others as well, but this is the only entire one, the oldest entire one that we have. Uh, and, and so I brought this from that, and you can, if you Google Leningrad Codex, you'll get to a site. It takes a little bit, Google. By the way, I've noticed, in general, with Googling, uh, sometimes if you just go to Google, as opposed to what I use, I use a duck, duck, uh, duck, duck, go, um, to for protection. Uh, if you uh, very often you don't get there with duck, duck, go. So you sometimes you have to use different search engines. In any case, if you want to take a look at that, that's an interesting thing. That's a piece of history. Um, I I I think it's I think it's in Leningrad today. That is in. Uh, in St. Petersburg, right? St. Petersburg is Leningrad. Anyway, I actually don't know where it is today. Uh, and this is the basis for the scientific edition or the critical edition of the Bibles that many of us use called Biblia Hebraica. Um, I've shown it to you here at the house. It's a big fat volume and uh, that's considered authoritative for the Masoretic text. There are other Hebrew textual traditions like the Dead Sea Scrolls and like some, or like the Samaritan Torah scroll or, or some other not, you know, there's the Aleppo Codex, which is older, but it's not in, it's not, it's not whole, I think. I don't know. I, I this has never been a focus of my study. So if Malka, if you have anything else to say about this before we, we go on to what. Uh, no, else? thank you. I was going to say Aleppo, but you said it at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the Aleppo manuscript is a fascinating thing. And Matt, Matty Friedman once wrote it, Matty, Matty Friedman wrote a book about it and and I read years ago, even when I was, I don't think I was in the Bible department yet. I read some sort of dramatic uh, account of how it went from place to place, mm -hmm. but not our topic. The topic is the format. That's what I want to talk about. You have one format here of poetry. You have another format here of poetry. And, um, and as you can see, this is our text that each of the names of the kings and then the word achad. Achad. Last week I had made a suggestion that perhaps it is to emphasize the great victory, Echad, one, and another one, and another one, and maybe to slow us down. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. And uh, and 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 it's a pretty, otherwise, it's it's a pretty dry account. What's interesting here is the form, the, the scribal form, as opposed to the, the words themselves, I think. So, Malka... Uh, uh, I'll ask you in a second to do. Well, why don't you do this one as well? While I was looking for the source that you referred me to, when I was searching and searching other for, uh, uh, sources, Malka. Actually, we can go. Everybody has the the text in front of them. Sorry, uh, Malka. I came across this one from the Jerusalem Talmud. So it's uh, the the tradition you're going to read in a second from the Babylonian Talmud that you pointed out is in the same place in the Jerusalem Talmud. But I brought. This as well, because this goes to this goes to talk about um, whether this is necessary, whether in writing a scroll, whether it's the Torah or whether it's the prophets, you've got to write it this way. So, mm -hmm. Malka, go ahead and read this one for from the Jerusalem Talmud. Um, Jerusalem Talmud, Megillah 3, 7, Rabbi Zerah, Rabbi Jeremiah, in the name of Ra, that is the song of the song on the sea, and Deborah's song are written space on brick and brick on space. The 10 sons of Haman and the kings of Canaan are written on space and brick, space and brick on brick, since any such building will not stand. So hold on just a second before you go on. So uh, the brick on space, space on brick, that's the words and the veina is the, is the word that's used in Hebrew. And that's what they have to say here. In other words, what, what you can see. Uh, the the first one is on the left hand side, and the second one will be read is on the right hand side, and it barely mentions that because the building won't stand. We'll get to more of that later. Go ahead. How is that as meritorious act or as an impediment to the scroll being fit for public reading? Rabbi said to Rabbi Hanea, the son of Rob Hoshia, Hoshia. How do you say that? Yeah, Hoshia. Hoshia, brother, do you remember when we were standing in front of your uncle's store that Rabbi Ababa Zabda passed by 
And we asked him when he said, in the name of Rav, an impediment. Okay, so how do we read this? The oh, question yeah. is, <laughs> the question is, is this just a nice thing to do? Is it meritorious? Merit, not meritorious, meritus. Is it, it yeah. meritus? Is, is it, is it merit, meritorious? Meritorious. Is, is, is it an, a good thing to do? Is, is it a mitzvah? It's a nice thing to do. Or is it a mitzvah? It's commanded. And if you don't do it that way, then the Torah scroll, for instance, is pasul. <laughs> It's rendered unfit for public public reading. You might just say, "Well, there's some additions because you know, yeah. when you get to it, when you have a a, a, a Megillat Esther, there's a kind of Megillat Esther that people will pay extra for. Anybody know what it is? I don't know how. If ours is or not, I don't remember. <laughs> we had both of our our Megillat Esther. One is here, and one is it uh, with our daughter in Jerusalem. We commissioned both of them at different times from two different Supreme uh, scribes, um, both who friends, one a student and one an old friend, um, in memory of each in memory of our fathers when we passed away. And uh, or parents. Um, and, and so this is how I've showed you this before. And this is not. I think the other one might be. Yeah. So there's a way to write a scroll where the first word at the top of every column is Hamelech. That, that's how often it is. And there's a way to time it. You know, if you pace it right, if if the if the scribe is 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 very talented and takes more time in it, you can compute where to end, you know, how long to make your words, because nothing says it's got to be on every on a particular column. But there is this custom called Megillat HaMelech. So the word HaMelech, the king, appears at the top right first word of every column. So that's something that is that is a merit if you do it. It's kind of like you get extra credit points, but it's not necessary. Um, and what they're saying here is, is, is the question is, is, is it is it a merit to, to write the poetry in this way? And that is all these pieces of poetry that are mentioned here, right? Not just the Song of the Sea. But and and it does it it is it, 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 just the song of the sea and Devorah's song, which is in Judges, on one hand, or the sons of Haman in Esther and the text here in Joshua that we've been dealing with. Is it just extra credit, or is it necessary for the scroll to be kosher? And the answer is given in the form of an anecdote, which is you remember that time when we went, we bought some bubble gum at the liquor store. And we went outside and suddenly Rabbi so-and-so walked by and we say, hey, Rabbi, we were just thinking, we were arguing. Is this the case? And he says, yeah, that's the case. It's necessary. I, I just love it. I love the fact that this is how Jewish law was decided by an anecdote about remember when we were at the store together. I just, I don't know. I'm excited. Obviously, nobody else is excited. Richard might be a little excited. Malka's <laughs> excited and Sasha's chuckling. Okay. Uh, my question, I have a question. Is, is it um, this leads me to think that the Torah scrolls are they always? I always thought they were exactly the same. I mean, they they the format and the what words were on what column, and is is that not the case? Are they all are they different? Can can they one Torah scroll be longer or shorter than another? You know, Malka, do you know the answer to that? Because I'm not sure. No, I don't. Yeah. There there are differences because I, I know uh, um, there's what's called a Vav scroll, which in which every column starts with the letter Vav, but not every Torah is like that. So there is variation. Okay, so all the words are the same, but they could be long. If, if, if the scribe has a fatter penmanship, it would mean that there would mean more parchments. At the, uh, you know, it'd be a, it'd be a yeah. longer scroll. Yeah, if you know how some, sometimes I, I'll point out on the Torah scroll, you know when it's a, like a super talented scribe as opposed to a relatively or a less talented one is when there are words, but I think that the lines are supposed to be the same. I think the the the, the amount of lines might be different, but I think the words on each line are supposed to be the same, if I remember correctly. Because sometimes you have, whatever it is, sometimes you have a, a, a scribe who will write like a Lamed, really, really long, we'll stretch it out, or a cough, we'll stretch it out even in a bizarre form, just because otherwise he won't make it to the other end of the line. 
sorry, not my expertise. I can't imagine it's that hard to find out. A lot of these laws were uh, were scattered throughout the the Talmud. Many of them in Masechet Megillah because it deals with the Megillah, Megillah Tester. Uh, and then they were kind of uh, collected, and others were added in in a post Talmudic tractate called Masechet Sofrim, the the tractate of scribes, which is post Talmudic, but still from the second half of the first millennia of the Common Era. Um, yeah, okay, so all we want to say here is that, at least according to some, this was, it was necessary, the form, the format was necessary. Was, was, and, and, and when it says an impediment means that if you read from it, you weren't, you didn't fulfill the mitzvah of reading. Um, uh, with a Megillah stare, it's a lot looser, the laws. You can have pictures in them and you can read from that Megillah. You can say a blessing on it and you fulfill the reading as opposed to a Torah scroll that cannot have anything or anything. I think, yeah, I don't know, Haftarah. There's laws for the Haftarah scrolls. Um, okay, so now go ahead. This is the, the text that you referred me to, Malka, if you would, please. I forgot to number these texts, I see. So mm -hmm. Babylonian Talmud Megillah. Rabbi Hania Bar Papa said that Rabbi Sheila, a man from the village of Tamata, interpreted a verse homiletically. All the songs in the Bible are written in the form of a half brick arranged upon a whole brick and a whole brick arranged upon a half brick. This is the principle for all songs in the Bible, except for this song, um, referring and to the list of Haman's sons, and the song listing the kings of Canaan who were defeated by Joshua. These two songs are written in the form of a half brick arranged upon a half brick and a whole brick arranged upon a whole brick. What is the reason? So that they should never arise from their downfall. Would you like to explain that, Amalka? <laughs> well, is, is that the columns are arranged in such a way that if this was a, a building, they, it couldn't stand and that the kings would each would fall through the cracks in the um in the Torah scroll in the spaces, right? And and Richard knows this because of Lego. Richard does a lot of Lego building, and and so he knows this because you know through that. Yes, Ella. Oh, maybe is, is Song of Songs also written in that way, or is it written just straight across? No, Song uh, of Songs is is across. Exodus fifteen. I should have said up at the top left hand corner, the image. That's the quintessential one because it's so long. Mm -hmm. um, the truth of the matter is, though, that this, when it says songs here, by the way, we, we would say poetry, poems. Um, mm -hmm. But the, interestingly enough, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. oh I, I'm said, sorry. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry. I, I apologize. <laughs> Thank you, Sasha. I, I, Ella. Um, I, um, I don't know. I think, I think it's, it's, it's regular. Mm -hmm. I think it's regular. I know in yeah. Yair Zakovich's edition in Mikral Israel, he printed it, parsed it out because he saw he was trying to show that they're all just a cluster of poems. But I don't think I've ever seen a, I'm sure I've seen a Megillah of, of Song of Songs. Some people have collections of the five Megillah that are scribal. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's written regularly. Yeah. And, and what's also. Know. Interesting is that there is there's poetry at the end of Deuteronomy, and it's not written checkerboard like the Song of the Sea. It's written brick right. upon brick. Is that what you're showing us? Yeah, it's Hazino. Hazino, yeah, it yeah, was written out. Right. I was going to do the what Deuteronomy 34. Mm -hmm. Right. So that so all that means really is that is that either either he had a midrash that he wanted to say and don't bother me with the details. That's one possibility. Or that they had a different scribal custom. Uh, we we do know from the I mentioned this last time the small fragment from the Dead Sea Scrolls that has Deuteronomy has Hazinu in it or Zotha Bracha, mm -hmm. one of those two poems at the end that is written in two, in strophe form right in two columns. So I, I would imagine not only articles but PhDs have been written about this kind of stuff. Uh, again, it's not all that interesting to me, but what I, I what I I like though is that the message is in the form. Mm. Message is in the form. We think about how often we judge a book by its cover. You know, we decide to read a book or not read a book because of the cover, or to 
maybe even see a movie or not a movie by its name or its cover or, you know, and so on and so forth. Wine, wine's a great example, right? How many of us really know what are the good wines that are in the, the range that we want to pay, let's say between 10 and $15 and 15, and $20, you know, we, we, I often go by the label. <laughs> yes, Malka. No, I just, I thought it was funny when I read it. I kind of laughed to myself that he thought of a reason why it's written this way. Oh, yeah. they're just going to go to their death and never be resurrected again. So let's take another one, uh, another uh, uh, example of of Midrash that is based around, is connected to, connected to, to, to this particular poem and the way the format. So the format of the poem, there's the graphic format of the poem, and then there's a literary format of the poem. And, and that what I would say is the Echad, the Echad issue. What I commented on saying maybe to celebrate each one individually in a greater way, um, or alternatively, and now I'm influenced by the the war that continues to go on, even though the space of fighting might be smaller, the suffering continues in on both sides, and um, and perhaps to recognize, as I mentioned last week, to say, and that yes, and that's another life. We in 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 the Israeli press and the Jewish press. We every time some a soldier dies, we have a we have um, a short biography of that soldier, what unit they're from, what place they come from in Israel. In the Times of Israel, there's this whole section devoted to all the soldiers who have fallen, all the hostages that were taken, all those that were killed. It, it's usually at the bottom of their of their daily blast. You can find it um, because that's our way of lifting up and cherishing each of these victims. Um, I don't know that there's a parallel thing going on in the Palestinian world. My guess is they don't have the resources to do that. Um, but we speak in terms of Gaza, of the thousands that are killed, the hundreds, the thousands, and they're, mm -hmm. of course, um, anonymous. And we know that from the United States. I think I remember I have vague memories of the 60s during the Vietnamese War where uh, there there would be a daily mention of of the count, right? But were there pictures in the in the 60s on, on in the news as well of the soldiers that had fallen? I don't remember that. I just remember the, the body the body counts every day. Yeah. Well, yeah. It was in the press, there but might be pictures of a you know uh released for the those that passed. I mean it'd be an article. I mean it wouldn't be in the national press, it'd be local. Right. So in Israel, it's the national press, of course, smaller country, right? And but when you multiply that to, in any case, it's and and media is so different now in any. But we that's kind to me. That's kind of the that's what I thought maybe is a possibility as a midrash to understand. And now achad achad achad. Let's see uh, uh, another two ways of seeing that in the next two uh, sources. Rita Claire, do you want to read from midrash Rashid Rab at the bottom, please? The child grew and was weaned. Abraham made a great feast on the day Isaac was weaned. Abraham made a great feast, Rabbi Huda ben Rab Rabbi Simon said. This means that the great one of all worlds was present there. Rabbi Huda Bar Masparta said, the king made a great feast. The great leaders of the world were there. This is what is written. As the Lord will return to rejoice over you for good in the days of Mordecai and Esther, as he rejoiced over your fathers in the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Rabbi Yudan is making a connection, drawing a connection between Abraham and his feast and Ahasuerus and his feast. And who comes to the feast and what comes out of the feast, the celebration has to do with redemption, perhaps. Building on that, go ahead, the next section at the top of the second page. Sorry, I had to, I have the doors open and there's a lot of traffic. Uh, Rabbi Hesuda Ben Henahama said, those 62 kings that Joshua killed, all of them were at the Feast of Abraham, our patriarch. But were they not 31? It is rather like what Rabbi Barakahai, Rabbi Helbo and Rabbi pa Parmok said in the name of Rabbi Hohanan, Hohanan, the king of Jericho, one. 
why does the verse state one after each of the kings? The explanation is that it refers to him and his viceroy. So they had a tradition of 62. So some, it's like somebody said 62. Ooh, what's 62? There's 31 on the list. By, by the way, according to some of the modern commentaries, there's actually only 30 on the list. And, and mm -hmm. one of them is a name that got pushed together, even though it should be two separate names. It, it, one of them got divided, even though it should be uh, into two separate names, even though it should be one name. Um, but somebody says, what do you mean 62? Rebbe, 62, is, it's 31. So, ah, it's 31 plus one. So the achad is the plus one. Isn't there a movie out now, plus one? I think on Netflix or something, I saw some movie. Yeah, but that's when you get invited to a wedding. Yes, that's what the that's what the movie's yeah. about, Richard. Yeah. So either you get invited to a wedding, you get invited, you come with your viceroy. Um, I, what I what I what I I like about this was the sensitivity, to the fact that is this is really so that what's that one doing there? What's the achad doing there? What does that help us with? So one tradition wants to throw it was an even greater feast than that Abraham, right? It was a greater, greatest feast you could think of. How do you get that? Oh, it's like in Mordechai and Esther, in the, in, the, in the scroll of Esther, all the people of the world came is in order to lift up uh, uh, Abraham's uh, image. And then all that, how do we know there were so many kings? Oh, we know that from the list of 31, which is actually 62. Convoluted, but in essence, an explanation for a chad. The chad bothered those folks. They want to know why is that a chad there in the same way that I we asked the question. And one more tradition, which is kind of ingenious, and I think I'm reading it right, it's from a rather obscure uh, midrash called Midrash Tmura, which I think may have been published later, but 120 years ago or so, end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, there was an American rabbi, orthodox rabbi named Eisenstadt, uh, or Eisenstein, Eisenstein. I thought it was, why did I think it was Eisenstadt? Maybe I misprinted it here, but what he, he was a, uh, he was a, an anthologist, maybe we would call it. Um, he put together the first uh, Jewish traditional encyclopedia called Otsar Yisrael. I don't have it. We used to sell in the book. It's rather thick volumes that he, he, he copied from other places, of course. He went to do all the research himself. He um, published a book that I find is very, very handy. I think for all rabbis, I've always suggested my students they get it, called Otsar HaDinim Veha Min Hagim, a collection of, of customs and laws. And it has, in alphabetical order, you can quickly look up something, and then you find not only the halakha, that is a strict necessary things you need to do, but also interesting customs that you don't have written in other places or people that have limited libraries would never get to. He has a volume called Otsar HaVikuchim, which I, I should get it now that I'm dealing with Jewish Christian dialogue much more, but it's a collection of the literature, medieval literature called Sifut HaVikuach, the arguments, the debates, where um, rabbis would debate Christianity at least in a literary format. And there's some pretty ugly stuff in those in those things. And this is taken from Otsar Hamidrashim, which I do have. It's a two-volume copy. And what he did is basically he, he copied manuscripts that he found or that had been published in journals in different places and put them in alphabetical order. You could find them easily. And uh, it's not a great edition. It wasn't, I, I, I think he was kind of a one-man show, I'm guessing, uh, as we'll see in a second. So the the... Addition is is not up to our standards of what we expect, even in the beginning of the 20th century, I would say, but certainly it, it, certainly at the end of the 20th century of a Midrashic uh, text. And that's what we have here. Richard, why don't you read Midrash Torah 1? It's from Otsar HaMidrashim, Eisenstein. Okay. And a time to lose, corresponding to, and he killed mighty kings, that he destroyed them before Israel and empowered Israel over them. And who killed them? The Holy One, blessed be he, as it says, and he killed mighty kings. And it doesn't say, and they killed, for uh, if not for the help of the Holy One, blessed be he, they should not have defeated them. For his kindness endures forever, that he destroyed them before Israel and empowered Israel over them. And who killed them? The Holy One, blessed be he, as it says, and he killed mighty kings. 
and it doesn't say, and they killed. For it, for if not for the help of the Holy One, blessed be he, they could not have defeated them, for his kindness endures forever. Okay. Like, you can see in the text here that uh, I, I cut and paste because it's an English translation. Um, is that somebody put Joshua 12, 24, which is how I got to it, through Sepharia or Sepharia. Um, check the Hebrew. There is no uh, reference. And the truth of the matter is it doesn't say any killed mighty kings in our chapter either. Mm -hmm. That doesn't reflect it. That reflects Psalm uh, 136, uh, uh, verse 10. Uh, you, which we we say we say in, in traditional services every, it's Shabbat morning. It's the the great holiday or the Hillelam Haftal. Yeah, but it's is that called the great holiday? Part of the great holiday. In any case, and we have it at the seder as well. Mm -hmm. um, and and so now that I'm looking at this for the fourth time in the last uh, twenty four hours or so, I. Um, I'm not sure what brought whoever translated it to put Joshua 12.24. But, yeah, so now it sounds silly what I'm about to say, because it doesn't seem like this text refers to Joshua text at all. But if it did, <laughs> what I wanted to say was, that was the Achad. The Achad after, that's why I thought maybe it was ingenious, but perhaps this is a little bit too ingenious. The fact that after each of the names of the kings... The word achad one as but right. which is just in the simple meaning of text is and another one another one so maybe is the one the one right. mm -hmm. so it's a lovely little midrash but it probably has nothing to do with the original text uh, I have to see I have to see if midrash tamura I think I seem to remember there's a larger book I don't have it of uh, of a, a critical edition and see if it's in there or maybe there's something mixed up okay. so the echad is referring to Hashem. That's what I wanted to say, but I, I don't, that, that's, that a, makes sense. that's a lovely idea, but it's not based, I, I can't really quote Tamura because I don't know if we have the right text, mm -hmm. but we could make that Midrash. And I, okay, mm -hmm. and then I just want to go back to what, what I suggested that I'm thinking of writing a piece. I don't know if anybody's written about this yet or not, is that this year for Purim, instead of reading it in one breath, that we read it uh, very slowly, the 10 sons of Haman to really... Um, internalize. Each person is an entire world, even if they're our enemy. Each person who dies is an entire world. Okay. Adkan Takafari Shona. Until now is the first, uh, just catching up from last week. Any comments or questions? Okay. As always, uh, I, I, I really appreciate when you folks write to me afterwards. The best way to have that conversation is email, by the way, not not text message or if I see you want to talk about it, we can always talk about it. But if we want to uh, in, incorporate this and, and Malka's comments, so totally enriched uh, how, uh, it, you know, how we're doing our class today. And then, you know, these sheets is the first time I'm teaching Joshua, but these sheets become the basis for for future classes and 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 it, it, I think it's it, it's over it's a good thing yeah okay um all right then Dan uh 13 we're we're we, we've gone through the successes of Joshua but now three dots Dan Joshua is now old advanced in years God said to him, you have grown old, you are advanced in years, and very much of the land still remains to be, take, to be taken possession of. This is the territory that remains. All of the districts of the Philistines and all of those of the Geshurites, from the Shehor, which is close to Egypt, to the territory of Ekron in the north, are accounted Canaanite, namely those of the five lords of the Philistines, the Gazites, the Ashdodites, the Ashkelonites, the Gitites, and the Ekronites, and those of the Avim in the south. Further, all the Canaanite country, from Mehra of the Sidonians to Afek at the Amorite border and the land of the Gebelites, with the whole valley of the Lebanon, from Baal Gad at the foot of Mount Hermon to uh, Le Bohamat uh, on the east, with all the inhabitants of the hill country from the valley of the Lebanon to uh, Mislefot Mayim, namely all the Sidonians. 
I myself will dispossess those nations for the Israelites. You have only to apportion their lands by lot among Israel, as I have commanded you. Okay, so the first thing to notice is that if we thought that Joshua led the people of Israel in conquering all of the land, no, only some of the land. There are more than pockets. It's, it's, it's huge swaths, swaths of, of land that are unconquered. And okay, so we understand it was a process, but then that last line, whether it's part of the original text or it was added on by a far more theological editor, is that, but don't worry, you don't have to lift a finger. I'll make sure that it's conquered. How? We don't know. Because this, in essence, is an introduction to the next part of the book of Joshua, which is the apportionment of the land, the, the, the dividing of the land, of the inheritance to the different tribes and the families. Yes, Eva? No, I... Oh, okay. I was just thinking the same way. Right. So, again, if I'm not going to bring out the map, not my focus, but you could take it a map, you'd see it, and you'd, you'd see different places. It, it, we do hear about Gaza, though, the whole area of the Gaza Strip. Northward is was almost always Phil, uh, Philistine. Here it's called it's thought of as Canaanite lands. It's later unclear what the author wants to do here. Does he want us just to think of all as Canaanite as a catchphrase for all of them? It's, we, we see Canaanite often includes other nationalities. It's a kind of a, a moniker, um, and uh, if I'm using that right. And um, and so it, it's really unclear. There, although there was a time in medieval history where there's and we have the ruins of a synagogue or the mosaic floors of a synagogue in the Gaza Strip that we used to go look to. It wasn't kept up well. Who knows what happened to it since after the pullback. But in biblical times, this was not really ever ancient Israel. It's part of the promise, part of the dream, but not part of reality, at least according to the, the text that we have. So Dan, why don't you read another one for us? Therefore, divide this territory into hereditary portions for the nine tribes and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Now the Reubenites and the Gadites, along with the other half-tribe, had already received the shares that Moses assigned to them on the east side of the Jordan, as assigned to them by Moses, the servant of God. From Aroer on the edge of the Wadi Arnon and the town in the middle of the Wadi, the entire tableland from Medeba to Dibon, embracing all the towns of King Sihon of the Amorites, who had reigned in Heshbon, up to the order, border of the Ammonites. Further, Gilead, the territories of the Geshurites and the Maakathites, and all of Mount Hermon, and the whole of Bashan up to Salka, the entire kingdom of Og, who had reigned over Bashan at Ashtarot and at Edre. He was the last of the remaining Rephaim. These were defeated and dispossessed by Moses, but the Israelites failed to dispossess the Geshurites and the Maakathites, and Geshur and Maakath remain among Israel to this day. No hereditary portion, however, was assigned to the tribe of Levi, their portion being the fire offerings of the Eternal, the God of Israel, as God spoke concerning them. Okay. So two things that pop up to me at, at the end of this passage, which are more interesting than the others, is that this comes to justify when the time this was written, there were still indigenous people living amongst the Israelites. So this idea that even under David, even under Solomon, whoever it was, there were uh, there was a time when everybody was an Israelite except for the few um, uh, outliers like um, Ur Uriah, Uriah Hiti in the story of David and Bathsheba or others. Um, no, there were there was a time there there was always this presence of these other people who were assimilated into, or they were uh, they were they assimilated, or they, well they didn't entirely assimilate, but they were taken in, and maybe this explains a lot about the laws for the other, the the ger, the toshav, you know, the the foreigner who lives amongst you, and the, the other thing that sticks out here is that. Um, is this repetition of, of of what we have in the Torah as well in, in Numbers when the land is being divided, that Levi doesn't get a piece of land? Oh, because they, their their, their portion is God's fire. Yeah, well, physically, yes, that means they get they get the sacrifices and the the tithing, but 
it's kind of like, you know, imagining Levi, tribe Levi. Yeah, yes, but God, how come we don't get a piece of that? Oh, you have me. You get to serve me, right? So. Yeah. Any any comments or questions? Okay. Megan, you want to read 15 to 23, please? pronounce it all. Um, and so Moses assigned the following to the tribe of the Reubenites uh, for their various clans, and it became theirs. The, the territory from Ar Arar at the edge of the Wadi Aran, Arnon and the town in the middle of the Wadi up to Med Med Mediba, the entire tableland. Heshbon and all the towns in the tableland, Debon, Bahmoth Baal, Beth Baal Meon, uh, Jah Jahaz, Kedemoth, <laughs> uh, Meph Mephath. You could just skip to, you know. Uh... Oh, those down there. You can read those. Uh, um, I can say Piscah. Uh, and all the towns of the tableland and the entire kingdom of Sihon. Uh, the king and of the Amorites who had reigned in Heshbon. For Moses defeated him and the Midianite chiefs, Evi, Rekim, Zur, and Hur, and Reba, who had dwelt in the land as princes of Sion. Together with others that they slew, the Israelites put Balaam, son of Beor, the Agor, to the sword. The boundary of the Reubenites was the edge of the Jordan. This was the portion of the Reubenites for their various clans, those towns with their villages. I have a question. Yes. It, it always bothered me that I don't remember ever seeing the Valley of Jezreel, Emek Israel, in, in the apportionment of the land. And that's a pretty big chunk of territory, which is very, very fertile. Okay, so what the land's being described here is on the other side of the Jordan. These are the two and a half tribes that Moses already okay. divided the land. They'll get to the land to Joshua afterwards. And, um, and, and whether or not it appears, I haven't prepared that far ahead, that's next week or the week after, um, doesn't mean because it's not there, it means because it's perhaps just called something else. I get you. Yeah, but I, I think that we will find it, actually. Um, okay, does anything stand out here for people? Anything that... that... For me, that they mentioned Baal. The, they mentioned Baal? Or... Uh -huh. Balaam, Balaam, the son of Balaam. Beor. Yeah. Yeah. What from numbers, right? From... Right, right. So there's... there's so it actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a side comment. It's a mm. sidebar which is why I think the translation put it in parentheses here. It relates to the story um, in, in Numbers about the prophet not of Israel who was hired by the Moabites to curse the Israelites instead of a curse. Mm -hmm. He ends up giving us a blessing. Uh, he's called here, an, uh, what's the word, ogre, an auger. In mm -hmm. Hebrew, it's kosem. Kosem and ksavim have to do with um, mm -hmm. telling the future and, uh, yeah. Isn't Kosem a magician? In modern Hebrew, it's a magician. So in, in biblical uh, Hebrew, it's it's someone who knows how to figure out what's going to be in the future with mm -hmm. Samim, with these, these this equipment that he has. And uh, so it's not for entertainment purposes. Uh, interestingly enough, in the story of Bilam in Numbers, it has him, um, the way that he brings about his prophecy is not through the stuff. It says that they brought his ksamim, they brought his equipment, but he doesn't use the equipment. Instead of it, it says he offered sacrifices. So mm -hmm. different traditions. The the Probably the most interesting part of Bilam ben Boor, from my point of view, is that he has an existence outside of the pages of the, of the mm -hmm. Torah, of the Hebrew Bible. Um, there's a, an important uh, inscription called uh, from a place called Der El Bala. Der El, Der, Der El, Der El Allah. Der, 
Mirabella, isn't it in Gaza though? No, no, no. This is on the other side. Where does Jordan today? Mm -hmm. Um, and there. Oh, oh. I'm sorry, I don't remember. But it's 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 a, a inscription, and there's a lot of controversy over it because it was written on ink, on um, on uh, plaster or something, and they had to reassemble it like a puzzle. But in any case, the, it's clear that Bilam ben Baor is mentioned there, and mm -hmm. all it does, it's uh, all it really tells us, is that. Um, is that in the same way the Torah chose to talk about a non-Israelite prophet and to raise his memory in such a way that he's an important figure in the ancient Near East? That's I mean that's really all it tells us. Mm -hmm. He's on the on the on the on an inscription in a in a temple. Um, yeah. So there's something else here that connects to Jordan today's trend, Jordan, and that is uh, Medeba or Madaba, uh, which I think I put in bold. And this is not really connected to the book of Joshua, but it's a cool thing as well. Does the name mean anything to anybody? Um, Isn't it significant for um, Muslims? Is that the Madiba? Um, it, it, today there is, but in, uh, uh, the, it could be, but the, the significance is from an archaeological point of view mm -hmm. is... Is the Medeba map, which is a mosaic, found on the uh, uh, on the floor of a church before it become became uh, Muslim? The, that part mm -hmm. of the world, in the sixth century, and uh, I think the, it's the Saint Church of Saint George. And this is a reconstruction of what of uh, or uh, you know some sort of rendition of of what it is. <clears throat> I I couldn't find where it is today, but I'll, I'll tell you why I know about it. I can't give you a whole tour of it. But basically, uh, this is the ocean, and um, this is Jerusalem. So, mm. you know, it it it, it probably. Uh, I'm sorry. This is the the Dead Sea, and this is Jerusalem, and it and it shows that um, uh, Medeba. I think is it, it's it's oriented around Medeba, if I remember correctly. But the reason it's most famous to tourists and tourist guides mm -hmm. is because of this section right here which is Jerusalem. This is a map of Jerusalem in the 6th century of the Common Era. This is says Jerusalem. And um, this right here is the Cardo, Cardo Maxima, I think it's called, but the Cardo is the main street. And if you've been to, in, in 1967, when they started to excavate um, the old city, the Jewish quarter in the old city, uh, they found this street, and they found exactly this place. And so there's this picture, a mosaic like this, a re mosaic reproduction is on the wall uh, of where you, you could walk on the street here at the level of what it was during Roman times. And it was a marketplace. It was a major artery. And, and they found other things according to this map. So it, it's considered to be a, a rather accurate of what Jerusalem was in the 6th century. That's its importance. And so a lot of people know of the Medeba, or the is, Madeba. Is the, other, is the other is the language Greek that they're right? Yeah. Reading? yeah, that's Greek. Yeah, yeah. So um, and another important part of the Madaba is uh, map is for Christians, <clears throat> and this is the place where uh, of John the Baptist on the Jordan River. You can see <laughs> this is coming out of the Kinneret and um, in the sea. Yeah. So if you want to look for more, you look up Madaba, and uh, and and it's again, it's one of these things. If Harold was here, Harold certainly knows about this. this is the kind of thing that biblical biblical archaeologists has an article on, and uh, the Wikipedia article wasn't that good. It it doesn't tell you where it is today. It gave you some of the points. In any case, if that interests some folks, that it's considered to be the first um, map. That we have documentation of, I'm pretty sure that's it from the first cardi cardiological something like that, right? Uh, so really has nothing to do whatsoever with with the uh, with the text we're doing, other than that it was a major city in the times. There's excavations there from the Bronze Age, I think. There it was an important city. Okay, 
let's uh let's move ahead richard you want to go 24 28 we did we just did the territory of reuben now we're doing of uh, god to the so, tribe of no, to the tribe of god for the various godite clans moses assigned the following and it became their territory jazir all the towns of gilead part of the country of the amorites up to uh, aurora uh, which is close to rabah uh, and from hezbon to ramath Mitz mitzvah to uh, bedonim and from um, mahanam to the border of Libir, and in the valley of Beth Haram, Beth Minra, Sukkot, and up to the tip of the Sea of Chinnereth uh, on the east side of the Jordan. That was the portion of the Gadites, of the Gadites, with their various clans, those towns with their villages. Okay. I don't really have much to say about this. Anybody? Just the thing that struck me: why is the why and all these uh, uh, assignments by Moses in the Torah rather than here in this book? All right, so that, let's go back to that after we read the next Chatsi Shevet Menashe. The good question. Let's go back to that. Uh, so, Richard, why don't you read the last section? And to the half tribe of Manasseh, Moses gave the following, so that it went to the half tribe of Manasseh for its various clans and became their territory. Mahanaim, all of Basham, the entire kingdom of Og, king of Basham, and all of Havoth, Jair, in Bashan, 60 towns in part of Gilead and Ashtaroth and Edri, the royal cities of Og in Basham were assigned to the descendants of Makir, son of Manasseh, and a and to a part of the descendants of Makir, to the various clans. Those then were the portions that Moses assigned to the steppes of Moab uh, on the east side of the Jordan. But no portion was assigned by Moses to the tribe of Levi, the Eternal, the God of Israel, is their portion, as God spoke concerning them. So. The two and a half tribes, the story is in numbers, as Dan mentioned. The giving of the land, of course, they had to, they conquered it under Moses, which is why this whole section is, is really not about Joshua at all. It's about Moses, but the section is connected to inheriting the land. This is the beginning of the whole section of Joshua. It talks about the Dachala. We had the wars, now it's the inheritance. And if you want to talk about inheritance of the land, well, first of all, you have to talk about what happened before Joshua? Um, interesting. This, I, this, this, this mention of the Levites at before the two and a half tribes are mentioned in detail, the land, and then at the end of it as well. It's not the exact same words, but it's the same matter, same issue of not Levites not having, and it's really not relevant so much. But maybe it's how the editor or the author delineated this section to say to kind of show us. You know, this is not this. This is part of the overall story, but it's not really intrinsically part of the book of Joshua. I don't know. I don't know. Um, and as I said, we're going to get to some really dry, dull parts. Uh, what I tried to do today was to lift up <laughs> some rather obscure and and irre relatively irrelevant to our study issues to make it a little bit more interesting, so we don't uh, uh, we don't drown in the geographical details. Parting comments, friends. Okay, then. Be well. Let us know if there's any issues. Tomorrow is uh, is we go back to the study in the afternoon in person at St. Paul's, if you'd like to come. And uh, to let people know that I'll be speaking at the, I'll be giving the sermon the Methodist Church this Sunday uh, at both services. I think there's one at like 8.30 and 10, two services. I, I, uh, we'll, we'll put out a notice on Friday. And uh, Tor Trek is on Monday. Be well, everybody. Thanks for being here. Bye.
when it's Monday, 